Good morning or afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the webinar. My name is Joe Johnson, and I'm the marketing coordinator for the electric and gas utility team here in Redlands, California. Our webinar today is a joint webinar with Esri, SSP Innovations, and Intermountain Rural Electric Association, which is titled Utility Network, Users Provide First Impression. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. I'll then turn it over to our main speakers. On this slide, you'll see the different options you have during the webinar. You can change how you connect to the audio or adjust your view. Also, keep in mind you can ask questions during the webinar using the webinar dialog box and hitting the send button to submit. There will be time for questions and answers towards the end of the webinar. Finally, we will send out a copy of this recorded webinar to um, in about one week to everyone who has registered. Now I'd like to introduce our four speakers. First, Bill Meehan is the Utility Solutions Director at Esri. Dwayne Holt, GIS Director at Intermountain Rural Electric Association. Sky Perry, Principal Consultant at SSP Innovations and Corey Blakeborough, also a principal consultant at SSP Innovations. With that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Bill Meehan. Thanks, Joe. As this, uh, this first slide shows a, um, uh, an old map of a, basically it's an electric operating map. And I worked for a power company for many years before coming to Esri, and these kind of maps were very, very common. But they had sort of a, a single purpose was basically to find things, is uh, networks, is transforms, and so forth. And so this map was really about how things looked so I could look on the map. And it was also about paper. I mean, they were almost like documents, uh, engineering documents that had signature blocks and that sort of thing. And so the, the, the next uh, slide I'm going to show you is a, a GIS version of that same map. Uh, and what you, you really note about this is it's essentially the same thing. It looks very similar to the old map, but it was produced by a GIS. The look and feel and the size were the same. And in fact, even kind of the workflow around how these maps were used was very, very similar to the old maps. And part of the rub there between uh, this map and other data sources was it was very difficult to kind of do two things. One, produce sort of a cartographic representation, something that looked really good. You could, you could see it and you could print it. And, and the network, the underlying network model that was in there. So sort of in parallel to this sort of GIS thing, sort of a historical sense, utilities created all kinds of additional network uh, data sources and network models. For example, they might create a a planning model, which was usually textual, where they would do load flow studies and, and loading analysis. Or maybe the protection department would keep a different network model, which was for fuse coordination and relay settings. And yet another department would, would keep a, a network model, would be the same network, but like kind of a different way of representing it for uh, insulation coordination, for things like lightning arresters. And, and back in the old days, people kept network models for their outage management systems and their gas network systems. Others kept one-line switching diagrams and a different network representation, maybe for design or asset management. And then utilities kept even additional uh, data databases for their structures, like their poles and their manholes and their, their um, meter boxes and so forth. And then even the customer uh, network, uh, the customer meters would be kept in a separate, separate location. So what you really had was multiple representations of the same thing. In fact, each one of those data sources was a sort of a different abstraction of the same network model. And that, that worked okay, but the, the problem was every time you had a change in the network, a transaction to the network, you had to remember where all these data sources were and how to change them and, and all of that sort of stuff. And then keeping cartography and network modeling in the same data source was tricky. That's why you had all these different abstractions. In 2000 or so, ESRI released what was called the geometric network, part of the, the large ArcGIS, uh, I think they call it version 8, back in the old days. And that went a big way, a long way in trying to solve this sort of representation of a cartography or a nice looking map so people could look at things and find things and also maintain the network model. Today, Esri is building a new utility network. It's, it's really brand new, where we've kind of resolved this cartography 
uh, it's kind of cartography meets network modeling. But it'll go, it goes much further than the geometric network. I mean, the geometric network did a really good thing, and it really lasted the test of time. But now we're, we, we see some new challenges by the utility industries. And so we need things like something that's cross-platform. This utility network is cross-platform. That means that it, it can operate on any device, anywhere, at any time. Uh, it's services-based, so it really keeps the, the, the network analysis and so forth kind of different from the visualiz visualization. It also honors 3D. Um, you know, the, the maps are really an abstraction of the reality, and we wanted to make sure that people, if they wanted to represent things in 3D, they could. And of course, all the rich network modeling is terrific. And so it has better cartography, better network modeling. It's just better. So let's get started. Let's take a look at how you could actually help start building this network model and really take advantage of some of the advanced um, advanced capabilities of this brand new utility network from Esri. So Sky is going to take it over and show you how to maybe test drive the system. Sky, take it over. Great. Thank you so much, Bill. Uh, we're actually going to start off today with a quick polling question. So we're going to switch over, and you should see this polling question come up. And the question starts off with, what is your awareness level of the utility network? And you should be able to click on any of the three options. Number one being the first time hearing of it. Number two, know a little bit about it. And number three being very familiar. So we'll give just a second for some of these votes to come in, and then I'll share the results with you. All right. So we've got about uh, almost 100% in here. And uh, give you a little bit of brief background here. It's about 16% of you, this is your first time hearing about the utility network. So that's uh, very interesting to see. About 61% of you know a little bit about it about the utility network, and 25% are very familiar. So thank you for your votes there. I'm going to go ahead and uh, close the poll, and we'll continue on. So our goal here with the presentation today is to really give you a little bit of background on what is coming within our industry. A little bit of background on who SSP is first. Uh, we're a consulting company. We work specifically in the electric, gas, water, pipeline, and fiber verticals, and really do anything and everything you might guess around the consulting side there, from product implementation, customizing those products, and integrating them as well. And I'm joined by my, uh, my colleague, Corey Blakeborough, here today for the presentation. So with that, let's just jump right in. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a background on the actual network to set the, the surface, set the basis for what we're talking about today. And then we have Dwayne, who will come in from Intermountain, to tell us a little bit about their experience in using the network. So the first question, why, why do we need a new network? You know, Bill talked a little bit about the geometric network, and that's been in place now. It's become pretty mature. Uh, development started, if you can believe it, in 1997. So the goal here is actually that we wanted to be able to create a network that will suffice for the next 15 to 20 years. The geometric's done very well for us, but uh, we're looking for increased performance. Uh, the geometric network can't be used in ArcGIS Pro, which is, of course, Esri's new technology uh, for the desktop. Uh, there's no native lifecycle management. So when you're talking about planned or designed versus existing features, uh, no native way to be able to determine tracing based on those attributes. And finally, there's not enough support for the future DMS or ADMS integrations, and that's driving a lot of, of, of components of our future industry. Everybody's looking that direction, maybe not this year, but in that 5, 10 plus years. So we needed a network that would accommodate today's needs but also allow all of you to have a, a support system that will allow you not only to support, but to engage and thrive in an environment with DMS. And finally, one of the other big challenges that came originally from Scott Morehouse at Esri was to make the entire solution services-based. And what does that mean? Bill talked about this too. It allows for consumption by any Esri platform, so certainly in the desktop, the ArcGIS Pro, but also via web and runtime, because now there's web services that enable the utility network to be used. So next, what is needed to engage with the utility network? The first and foremost is ArcGIS Pro today. So Pro, you've probably heard of it. If you haven't, I'm surprised. But this is Esri's native 64-bit technology. As Bill mentioned, it's 3D enabled natively. And this is the desktop application of the future. Now, we know ArcMap is supported now through 2021. Uh, but you know clearly that we're moving as an industry towards ArcGIS Pro. The next component is ArcGIS Enterprise, and this is a rebranded name you probably have heard, but it really uh, came out with 10.5, which was released late last year. And this is now inclusive of both Portal for ArcGIS and ArcGIS Server, so two major components there, both used heavily by Utility Network. And finally, an important note that you need to utilize an enterprise geodatabase. 
Uh, file geo databases are not supported, and personal not supported at all, to be very clear. Uh, so you have to use enterprise, and that means SQL Server or Oracle or Postgres. Uh, you're going to have to move that direction to be able to engage with utility network. So to start off, I'll lay the found foundation here. Uh, this is the data model. I'm going to break it down into some smaller components and talk about what is important, what you should care about today. So first, be comfortable. This still runs in a geo database. You know, people say, ah, it's new technology. I'm worried. But it's a new format. It must be created via ArcGIS Pro, but it's still a geo database. And again, has support for Oracle, SQL Server, and Postgres. Still uses feature class. So we, we know feature classes and object classes from all these years. That concept's still there and, and it will be very familiar. One key difference is, uh, is, is the Wild West, as we talked about, of the old data models is gone. In the geometric network, we have unlimited numbers of classes and subtypes and configurations. Now, the utility network mandates the specific feature classes that can be used within your network model. And what does that really mean? It means that we have fixed sets of feature classes. Now, when I create a, a, a utility network, I'll come back to that point in just a moment, but when I create a utility network, it creates an empty structure network, which I'll touch on again here in a sec, creates some system tables, and there's no domain network. So let's start in talking about what a domain network is. So the fixed feature classes, again, shared across all of the uh, the different domain networks. So you'll see that there's five feature class, classes listed here on the right, device line, junction, assembly, and subnet line. And those are the only feature classes that will be created. Uh, now, Dwayne's going to talk a little bit further in his presentation about how those can be delineated out to capture the de detail you need from your geometric networks today. So first thing about domain networks is don't get confused. Uh, while we're reusing that word domain, this, this usage means the commodity is a gas, electric, water, etc. Don't confuse it with your Esri field geodatabase domains, which we use heavily today. Next, a utility network, a single utility network, can have one or more domain networks. So you could have two different networks, one for electric distribution and electric transmission domains within the same utility network. For those of you out there that have multiple commodities, you could create an electric, gas, and water domain network, all within the single utility network. Versus today's, where inside of a given data set, you have individual geometric networks. Now we'll be combining into one indexed network. So each domain has these five feature classes, as noted. And connectivity can uh, occur between domain networks. You could have an electric domain network that feeds a water pump, as an example. Now, the question comes up a lot, why do we have fixed five feature classes? And the answer is both uh, for performance. Uh, if you think about the fact that now we can query only five feature classes and bring that data back. So we can optimize performance that way. Uh, also, the simplification of moving this all together allows this to be indexed and uh, created and managed in the back office uh, or really in the system in a very powerful way. So let me break this down with an example. This might help. So in our geometric network today, if you're an electric user, uh, gas folks, uh, water folks, bear with us. But uh, an electric example, very common, a primary line, a transformer bank that would probably have three related transformer units for a three-phase overhead bank, and then three secondary lines and three service points. So hopefully we're all familiar with that context. So what does this look like in utility network? Now we still have the one line, that's the primary overhead line, no big changes there. But now we're moving to a little bit more of a detailed model. And this again, uh, when we talk about the ADMS usage, ADMS often requires a more granular modeling of our, of our devices, and this is what we're seeing here. So now we're taking a junction, which is a tap, if you think about the real world, this is a tap off of that primary overhead line. We still have a transformer bank concept, but this is now acting as a, a assembly, which is a container for cartographic purposes of potentially units. So why do we need that? Because we're now modeling the individual three devices, the transformer devices, on the map as actual features. So you can see those represented there. Now we saw the secondary coming off of those, the A, B, and C phase, secondary coming off, and we have the same service points. So a slightly different model, a little bit more granular, but conceptually the same components that we have in the geometric network. Next concept I want to touch on is terminals. Now, a terminal is a logical connection point on a network device. So what does that really do for us? It allows more realistic modeling of devices. If we use that transformer example, again, it's a very easy context. If you think about the, the high side, the tap off of that primary comes into the high side, the primary side of a transformer. The low side terminals, the secondary, are now outbound, and they come off of different points on the same device. So having one device with one connection doesn't make sense, so we're getting a little bit more granular. So it's allowing us to map the internal nodes and edges within a topology within that device. 
So to be clear, terminals are defined for some devices, like transformers, but not all of them, typically ones that require a high and a low side for analytic purposes. Or think about those asymmetric devices. An example would be a network protector, or maybe a check valve, where uh, the commodity can only flow one direction. We can now model these things uh, correctly within the GIS. Here's a quick example of a terminal. Transformers, again, being the easy one. So that same example we looked at previously, a transformer, each of those transformers now has two terminals. Now, we model these often by uh, representing them with just using these black dots. You don't see those dots on the map, to be clear, but in this example, it helps to clarify. So we have the low side, which is the secondary outbound going uh, uh, down, and the high side, which would be connected into the primary. So we're able to connect both of those individually and show the two different voltages on the device. Let's turn now to the structure network. This is a network, and again, there's a single structure network within each utility network, and that structure network is shared among these various domain networks. This is a very cool concept, and it promotes typically non-networked uh, features into the network awareness. So think your poles, pads, vaults, uh, your ducts and trenches, your casings, your pits, and your stations. Anything that's there in your GIS but did not have network awareness in the geometric network now can. So it contains data that relates to the domain network, but it's not actually connected. So it's not electrically connected, but that, uh, that pole, for example, is attached to that device, the transformer. So each network has a single one. They share it across domain networks. And this has, a structure network has three feature classes. We can have a junction being a point. We can have a line or a boundary, which, of course, is a polygon. So let's switch over a little bit now, and there's this concept of associations within the utility network. And these are very important, a new concept. So let's talk about those individually. The first is connectivity association. This allows us to now establish connectivity without geometric coincidence. If you think about what that means, if you had the geometric network, we always had to have geometric coincidence, meaning the lines and points had to be touching. We can now do this, uh, allow point-to-point -point connectivity via these associations. Uh, and they're not drawn on the map. This is an internal connection within the actual uh, compiled utility topology. So the quick example here, again using the transformer example, is that high side terminal on the transformer devices can be inherently connected through an association to the tap point. Now we don't have to draw them on the map, but that connectivity is represented and usable by traces and all the other functionality in the network. Number two, containment association. This allows for a feature to act as a container or content to, or both. So I mentioned earlier that transformer bank is used as an actual container for the transformer devices. Why do we do this? It's because we don't have to have the granularity at all, all zoom levels, all scales within the map. So we can have the devices not be shown, but we still want to have that transformer bank representing there is a transformer on the map. But in certain cases, in more detailed cases, we're going to want to see those devices. So another quick example would be the, the, the substation boundary. Think about those uh, polygons you use to represent the fence of your substations. We can now model all of the inside detail of a substation, including the power transformers, the circuit breakers, uh, the circuit switchers, and all the bus work if desired. And we can have that only be shown when we have the content turned on within the map. And Corey will detail that in his demo a little bit later. Number three, the final association type is a structural attachment association. This allows for domain device or assembly to be attached to a structure. And to be clear, only structure junctions support attachment associations. And they're, again, not drawn on the map. But the example in our quick example will drop a pole in. Now, the attachment of the pole to the transformer draws some really interesting conclusions for us. If you think about performing a network trace on a given circuit, we can now derive all of the actual structures, the poles, the pads, the vaults, that are associated with that given circuit. Now, we've done this through customization for years, but now we can do it out of the box in the indexed out-of-the-box ESRI network. So let's move on to the next concept, and this is tiers and subnetworks. A tier is a way to distinguish levels within your domain networks, and you, this will make sense once we show some examples here. So on the electric side, think about your voltage levels, your transmission or high voltage, your primary uh, could be your medium voltage, and your secondary being a low voltage, so pretty, pretty easy to see there. Tiers within the gas system could be done different ways. A gathering from the wellhead to the compressor, transmission being that compressor down to your TBS, your town border stations, and finally the distribution, everything from those town border stations all the way down to the customer meters. So different levels within the domain network, to be clear. So what is a subnetwork then? They're, they're tightly intertwined, tiers and subnetworks. It's defined as a connected subportion of a domain network. So let's, let's, again, make this a little bit more clear. A subnetwork either has a defined source, 
which would be the source of the commodity. In electric, think your circuit breakers for your distribution side, your transformers for your secondary side, and on your gas side, your, your town border station feeds the gas into the distribution system, or even the well on the gathering side. That's your source. It can alternatively have a defined sink, and this is where it comes into play. Think about a water, a sewer, or a gravity-driven network uh, that's pulling the commodity down. So it would have a sink at the end of that network. So to put this into context, think about your defined electric circuits, your gas uh, pressure systems, or your CP zones, et cetera, your emergency isolation zones that you have in the geometric network today. Those will flow into a sub-network hierarchy. Take a look at these further. Each subwork has, again, it has a defined source, but it has a subwork network name. So this could be your circuit name, your pressure system name. It has an associated tier, my, my, my primary or my secondary level. And it has a single line representation in the subnet line feature class. And that's a really interesting aspect because now when we're, we're creating a given circuit, let's use that example, we now have a single line drawing and it's a single feature that represents the entire circuit. All of those color by feeder maps, we're all used to going through and setting uh, that circuit 101 is pink in about you know, 20 different layers. It's now done with a single layer and that's that subnet line. It's also increasing performance because how much faster it is to draw a single line than it is to draw hundreds or thousands of features within that circuit or system. And finally, that same subnet net network name, again your circuit name, your system name, is persisted on all of the features that participate in the subnetwork. So you'll get your circuit name down onto the devices, down onto your lines, down onto your junctions. So you have that persistence created natively by the Esri utility network. So we're now going to move on to our next polling question. Let me get this lined up here. I'll go ahead and launch this. So next question here is, would you like to receive educational demo videos and articles on the utility network? It's obviously a new concept, and you're attending today, so I hope the answer is yes, but we of course want to know if, if, if bringing more information over this in the next couple of years is beneficial to you. So a large percent coming in, let's see. Well, it's, it's pretty much a landslide on this one. So we have a, a 98, 99% no, voting yes and 2% that are saying no. So uh, we'll keep this focus. We, ESRI, mm -hmm. and other partners are all very focused on this and ensuring that we have information continually coming to you all. So I'm going to go ahead and close that vote, and we'll continue on. So it's my pleasure now to introduce you to Dwayne Holt from Intermountain Rural. And Dwayne uh, was one of our very first, in fact, our very first, uh, utility Network Jumpstart. So this is a program SSP's put out to allow customers to engage and use the Utility Network extremely quickly. Now again, the, the full beta, the unrestricted beta, number one, will be out at the end of the month, but uh, or close to it. I don't want to commit to dates, of course, but uh, toward the end of the month, we've been in a restricted beta period, and Dwayne was one of the first to engage with this and utilize uh, the technology. So Dwayne, uh, could you share with us a little bit about your, your experience? Sure. Uh, thanks, Guy. Um, well, let me start off by saying, you know, who we are, um, Intermountain REA, we're an electric co-op that serves uh, about 5,000 square miles in central Colorado. Um, we are situated between Denver and Colorado Springs. We serve west uh, to the Continental Divide and then east out into the agricultural plains. Um, we have a customer density anywhere from uh, 1,000 customers per square mile uh, down to less than a customer per square mile. Um, we have 900 or 9,700 miles of distribution transmission lines, and we have 151,000 electric meters. At our four operating districts, we have 225 employees. If you do the math there, that's about 670 customers to each employee. Um, that makes Intermountain one of the leanest uh, co-ops in the nation. I'll get back to that in a little minute. Um, we've used GIS here at Intermountain for about 10 years now. The GIS department is in, situated underneath the engineering division. There's six GIS staff members, including myself. And then in engineering, we have 25 designers that are using GIS on a regular day. Um, we also are very big on web services and ArcGIS Online here at Intermountain. Uh, we have 136 employees that are using ArcGIS Online and Collector on a daily basis. In addition, we have 31 contractors that are also using ArcGIS Online and Collector. Um, and anything from design to construction. In fact, all of our locator contractors use uh, ArcGIS Online for their locates in the field. Web services have become a critical part of our facilities and operations here at Intermountain. Um, on the GIS side, we've also become pretty important as far as a system of record for anything that is operationally related or facility related. 
Um, and of course, our GIS is made up of multiple components. On the Esri side, we have desktop, enterprise, collector. Um, we also use uh, Schneider's ArcFM and Designer. And all of this GIS data feeds other systems at Intermountain, our major business systems. Uh, on the CS side, we use uh, Harris Kayenta, and that includes everything from payroll to work management, ERP, basically all the ba major business systems. Um, our OMS is ABB with Sienna Tech. Uh, our SCADA is surveillance. Um, and we're currently out on an RFP right now for an AMI and MDMS system, which will uh, replace our ITRON uh, AMR system. Uh, so what were the business drivers we had for this Jumpstart program? And it really comes down to basically one word, technology. Um, management here is uh, very technology focused. Uh, we want to make sure that our critical systems are kept up to date. And that includes down to the patch level. We want to try to avoid uh, those multi-version upgrades that are so costly and time consuming. Um, we wanted to keep up with uh, ch changing technologies. You you know, if there's anything out there that uh, provides more efficiency or more accuracy, we wanted to jump on that. And that brings me back to that uh, number that I mentioned earlier, 670 customers to each employee. Um, you know, management's pretty proud of that lean profile that we have. Um, after all, that does keep the cost down for our customers. Um, how do we maintain that lean profile going forward with a growing uh, customer base and uh, higher demand for information, um, I think we do that by leveraging our current technologies better than we are today. Uh, you know, if that means changing business processes or whatever. Um, we also uh, leverage that by implementing new technologies, uh, anything that would give us more efficiencies, more accuracy in the data we're, we're working with. So the question would come up, why did we do the jump start now? Why were we the first ones to do the jump start? Why not wait for other utilities to test the waters a little bit like we've done in the past? Um, and that really did come down to timing. Um, there's a lot of initiatives, uh, implementations, upgrades, uh, modifications that are going on right now at Intermountain this year. Um, all of these uh, projects that are listed here involve GIS in some way. And we needed to make sure we understood how these changes that we're making in these initiatives uh, would be affected by anything new coming down the road from GIS. Um, so we wanted to learn from, from the jumpstart, you know, what, what kinds of vision there was, how the utility uh, network would affect uh, all these different initiatives. We want to keep that in the back of the mind while we're working on everything. Um, training, we wanted to know why there was a new utility network and what, what benefits we should expect from it. Um, better understanding of the model, uh, you know, how do all of our feature classes fit into these, you know, five feature classes that Sky mentioned. Um, planning, we wanted to understand our, our data conversion and, and prepare for that data conversion if there was anything we needed to do. Uh, what kinds of a effect would the utility network have on our integrations and our interfaces to all of these other systems? Um, and then we wanted to provide feedback to Esri. Um, you know, if you don't vote, you can't complain, right? Um, we wanted to calm our anxieties. You know, GIS is changing a lot. You know, it's not just the utility network, but a lot of changes to GIS. And, and change brings fear. So we wanted to ease some of those anxieties that we're building. Um, and then with the Jumpstart, what we did learn is that it, it actually isn't as hard as we were anticipating or had feared. Um, you know, they, uh, uh, Sky has showed this uh, model with the domain network and everything, and, and really, the smaller portion that I'm showing here is, is the meat, meat of the utility network. Um, the utility, you know, for us at Intermountain, the utility type, our electric, is obviously going to go into the domain. And then our voltages will go into those tiers, and then we'll break that out even further to our circuits. Um, you know, our transformers, our reclosers, our fuses, those will go into our device feature class. Um, all of our wire, our transmission, secondary, primary, that's all going to go into our line feature class. But one thing I wanted to add to the uh, model here that we that you don't see very often um, is that each of these feature classes under the domain network include uh, an asset group and an asset type. And, and this is was key to us learning this part of it in, in that our point feature classes will obviously go to our device. But then we would break those out into asset groups, our fuse asset group, our transformer asset group, and then we'd further break those down into like our overhead transformers, underground transformer types. And, and it seems like a pretty straightforward mapping for us. Um, the other major portions of the utility network, of course, were network associations. 
you know, connectivity association. We're looking at, uh, you know, a fuse that we typically would place a short edge piece to offset it off the main line and represent which tap that fuse was feeding. We no longer need those uh, offsets to model that fuse. We can place that fuse connectivity at the tap point and then cartographically show that fuse in a physical place different. Um, containment associations, you know, substations, transformer banks, switch cabinets. At Intermountain, we map all the switch cabinets with switches, fuses, and all the bus bar that connects them. Um, now we can do that containment association with just uh, connecting switches and fuses. We could probably eliminate 32,000 bus bar features from our geodatabase. That's probably going to be a pretty good performance benefit for us. Um, there are challenges with every beta, um, and we would expect that in this jumpstart. Um, there were product challenges and, and uh, data challenges as well. Um, you know, the product does require, Utility Network does require ArcGIS Pro, um, which we found to be a little bit bulky and had some performance hits, especially when it was working with Utility Network. Um, now, remember, though, in the jumpstart, we were doing this on remote desktops uh, across the Amazon Web Services. Um, so there's a whole host of internet connectivity issues that could have been causing performance as well. But um, as far as the utility network model, um, that's general for all utilities. It, it works for gas, it works for water, it works for telecom, electric. Um, so probably in my over anticipation, I was hoping there would be something in there as far as uh, a true phase awareness within the model, you know, an integrated awareness. Um, that's not there, but it's still there the same way we do it today. There's the, uh, uh, you know, the attributes and, and the configurations that you can do and the rules that you can apply to for phasing. Corey's going to show us a little bit about that a little bit later. Um, associated connections. Um, when, when we were tracing and building the network, that works really well with the network diagram tree and everything that you'll see Corey work with. Um, but when we were actually trying to debug something, we had some issues with with trying to figure out where a trace was going wrong. Um, and maybe that's something that a partner could provide, some sort of graphics that represent those associated connections. Um, it's not something you want features to show, because if you show those as features, you're obviously going to slow the network down more. On the data side, Intermountain is missing all of our data, transmission data. We don't have any of it modeled. Um, and, and it's going to be easy to model now. We've always wondered how we would add that to the geometric network, or if it would be a separate network. Now it's just going to fit into our electric domain. Secondary voltages, um, we don't have those modeled very well. And if we're going to utilize uh, the terminals and everything that Sky was showing, um, we need to get those modeled and, and clean up some of that data. Um, and then the other thing we have, we said we were really big on web services, um, but we don't have portal. We use ArcGIS Online mainly. Uh, utility network is going to require portals, so that's an implementation that we'll have to go through here um, before we commit to the utility network. Um, there is a lot of future potential with this model. It was actually pretty amazing to see the idea generation that came out of the GIS team from this Jumpstart program. Uh, a lot of really good ideas popped up. Um, you know, I even came up with an idea of using subnetworks to model fault coordination zones in addition to our circuits. Um, you know, for when we're doing those coordination studies every five years in cap placement programs. Um, you know, ADMS, as, as Sky mentioned, is coming to every utility eventually. Um, we need to model our full system, transmission all the way through secondary. Um, that's easy to do now. There's not a lot of configuration. You just add features. Um, as we add ADMS and AMI, we're going to expand our fiber network and communications. Uh, and right now that's all tracked on paper, but we should probably throw that into a domain network. I don't know if we need a full fiber management program because we're not leasing it but we should at least have it in the GIS. Um, and then, of course, full substation modeling. We have it modeled for SCADA devices. We don't have all the non-SCADA devices modeled in the substation, so we need to do that. Um, the Jumpstart did reveal that there will still be a need for partners. You know, one could hope for an out-of-the-box product that suits all our needs, like uh, Word or Excel. But I think when you're talking about any major business system, that's not going to be the case anymore. Everything is going to require partners. and configuration. Um, the first partner you're going to want is Esri. Um, you know, they're listening to the utilities right now, um, and there's more to this change than just the utility network. Um, so at this time, the GIS is changing at the same time utilities are changing. Um, you need to get in 
uh, engage with the uh, Esri, get with your account reps, your training reps, your user groups, and, and tackle all, or get in contact with all those resources that are available. There's there's no reason to try and do this on your own. Um, third party partners, uh, utilities are going to have to re rely on those. I think going forward, um, there's everything from conversion methodologies. You know, it's not overly complicated to convert, but again, it's not table to table mapping either. Um, automation of those uh, tracing tasks or geoprocessing tasks. Um, it's about a six step process manually out of the box to trace them. And, um, you put that in a model and, and automate it and put in a tool set and you have a single button that maybe handles six different electric traces or something like that. Um, and then these partners, are, as they work with other utilities, are going to come up with the best practices that are, are, are good for electric and good for gas, good for water. So that, that's a, a strong need for partners there. And then we also did provide feedback to Esri, as we mentioned. Um, we did send uh, 21 different issues uh, to e SSP who forwarded those on to Esri and actually within a couple days SSP forwarded back their responses. Um, everything was answered completely and and uh, sometimes with multiple answers. Um, Esri's even contacted us, the development team. It's actually kind of nice uh, that we're engaged with Esri at this level right now. Um, why should you try the UNJ um, or the utility network jumpstart? Um, it's not this isn't a sales pitch, it's more of a community pitch. Uh, the utilities are one of the strongest verticals that Esri has. Um, we need to stay together and make sure we're feeding Esri all the information they need to build forward. Uh, SSP obviously is running the jump starts. Uh, they're the ones that have published the most information about the utility network. They've clearly taken the time to dig into it, understand it. Um, I would consider them the experts at it right now. Um, Remember, not all utilities are going to be the same. I, what we reported as, a, as our mid-sized electric co-op isn't the same thing that an investor-owned East Coast utility is going to report. Um, certainly not what a gas or a water utility is going to report. The more feedback we can send to Esri, the better fit the product will be for all utilities. Um, Esri is looking for that feedback. They want to know, are there any current showstoppers before they put that first release out? Um, you know, they've been working on this for several years. Uh, so what are they working on right now? I think they're working on enhancements, and we need to get that information to them so we know what enhancements we'd like to see, what enhancements or how those enhancements should work for us, those kinds of things. Um, you know, you have to remember all of this is not just the utility network. It's GIS change at the same time. It's ArcGIS Pro, it's portal, it's geoprocessing, web services, all that stuff. Um, so this statement here, everything you do today, you will do differently tomorrow. Um, sounds very, very, very scary, but it's actually a good thing. As we move forward, you're going to be able to utilize the utility network and use uh, faster hardware for processing. You're going to be able to turn your GIS from a data uh, repository into a data dissemination tool. You're going to put data ownership in the end user's hands with web services. You know, it's any data, anywhere, anytime, on any device. That's where all technology is going. That's where GIS is going, and utility network is going to help us get there. Um, so right now, I think I want to turn it back over to Corey for a demo. Um, and I, uh, Corey is the pr uh, senior consultant with SSP Innovations. Um, he's the one that came to Intermountain and uh, helped us work through our part, uh, Jumpstart program. Corey? Great. Thanks, Dwayne. All right, let's go ahead. And uh, start off on this demo here. And uh, we're looking at the Neighborville Electric demo. Uh, we're looking at the uh, uh, specifically two circuits here in Azure sample data. So we'll go ahead and zoom into our south substation here and create a new circuit. So uh, let's go ahead and create some new features here. We're going to search for a new template here. We've we've created templates here across the board to make uh, to make our clicks a little easier to make things a little more streamlined here. We're going to place this circuit breaker. It's got an ABC phase pre-populated on it uh, inside of our substation here. So as that creates, our next step is to create an underground primary line here coming out from the substation. Uh, and we've got a riser configured at the end of this template here. So we'll go ahead and place that. You may be wondering, though, uh, why I didn't directly connect that to the circuit breaker. And that's because, as we've talked about, I don't necessarily have to now. Uh, so I'll go ahead and create a connection point over here on the, uh, on the left side here. We'll place that down. And now we're going to create uh, an association. So uh, 
In order to do that, we'll, we'll want to create uh, uh, modify the associations of the circuit breaker here, and uh, we'll, we don't need geometric connectivity anymore in order to make those associations. So as you can see, uh, we'll go ahead and select the circuit breaker here, and you'll see some terminals pop up. You've got uh, the source and the load side terminals. These are the terminals that Sky was talking about earlier. We want to use the load side terminal here, and we'll go ahead and connect that over to our connection point that we just placed. And uh, hit apply here. And with that, just like that, we have connectivity uh, without any geometric coincidence. So now we've got everything up to that riser, so let's go ahead and continue. Uh, we've got our overhead here that will continue off of from the riser, and I've actually created sort of a, a complex template here that will actually draw out an A and a B phase tap also. So let's go ahead and place that, and I'll explain more about that in a second here. All right, looks good. So we have everything drawn out here, and I'll actually uh, clear the selection uh, just to show you guys that a little better. So now we have an A and a B phase tap, and we have a whole lot of points coming off of those, uh, those tap points, as you can see here. So let's actually go ahead and zoom in here and take a look. And uh, we're going to be associating and, and creating associations here, so we'll, we'll go pre prepare that here. Uh, but we've got our tap, our transformer bank, our transformer, and our connection point up, uh, downstream there. But this point I want to kind of focus on for a second. That's our tap. Uh, that's going to be an A phase tap specifically, even though it's on an A, B, C phase line. Uh, that line right here continues to flow through because of the configuration of the utility network. So uh, moving on, we're actually going to create associations with that transformer. The high side terminal will connect up here to the tap, and we'll, uh, we'll wait for that to go here and hit apply, and the low side terminal Let's go ahead and select that uh, downstream connection point, that outbound connection point to be, be used with our secondary. And uh, you don't necessarily have to have that, but it's, it's very helpful just to illustrate the uh, connectivity associations. Here we're selecting our transformer bank, and let's go ahead and add content here, our transformer here. Uh, so now our transformer uh, is content of that transformer bank, that assembly. Uh, so the transformer device, we're, we're going to leave that visible checkbox off. And when we click Apply, uh, it'll actually disappear from the map. Let's actually clear the selection to show you that a little better. Uh, and so that actually helps. You can kind of hide the underlying information off of your containers, but if you click here, you can actually show them again as necessary. So you have that kind of granular control that Sky mentioned earlier uh, to show or hide the content of your containers. So uh, we'll keep that on for now, but just to show you how that works a little bit. Now let's go ahead and take a look at this B phase tap. We're going to do essentially the same thing here. Uh, establishing our containment first, since we already had that populated here, and uh, selecting the transformer, and apply here, and we'll move on to the connectivity. Uh, we'll go ahead and select that transformer, and again, high side terminal will go up here to the tap, and the low side terminal, there we go, will go down here to this connection point, the outbound connection point here. So with that, we have our connectivity defined all the way down. To, the, to those outbound connection points on the A phase and the B phase, uh, respectively. So whoops, uh, let's go ahead and uh, populate our secondary here. We'll start with B phase, uh, since we already have that visible. So we'll go ahead and draw out our secondary, and the template also has a service point uh, configured at the end of it. We'll go ahead and draw two of these here uh, on each of these. We'll go move over here to the A, A phase tap here. There we go, and draw that in as well. All right, so uh, as we draw out the second one here, that's going to be the last uh, editing operation that we're really going to need to do here. Let's make sure we uh, save that off here. And uh, from there, we'll be able to ultimately have uh, our network drawn out the way we need to. So now we really just need to establish this into the utility network. So the, what we want to look at next here is uh, our dirty areas layer here. So if we turn this on, you can see all these rectangles, these purple rectangles here, uh, they represent uh, data that has not yet been validated into the network topology. Uh, so let's go ahead and validate it. We'll, we'll validate the current extent here. It's going to check for any errors, and if there aren't any, those uh, rectangles will go away, and these features will actually be built into our utility network. Yep, looks like that works just fine. Um, so now everything's built in, and the last thing we need to do is set our circuit source. So we'll go ahead and hit our circuit breaker here and, uh, and, and establish that as the source 
source of our circuit and, and the, the, you know, the, the source of our connectivity. So uh, this subnetwork controller name, we'll just enter in, um, let's see, SSP, we'll just enter in a, you know, a number here. Just, this is basically establishing our circuit name. It's just a fancy way to say this is our circuit name here uh, that we're establishing. So let's go ahead and hit apply there. And, and now the subnetwork controller has been established, which means our circuit source is now created. So we have our circuit fully established now. Everything is built into the network. So our last step here is to show you a trace. So let's go ahead and set our circuit breaker as a trace location. Again, we want to set the load side terminal here. We want to trace off the load side. And we'll show you a downstream trace first. Uh, this is using uh, Esri's out-of-the-box geometric, excuse me, uh, utility network trace tool here. Uh, and you, you can see here that everything has been selected from the result, uh, with one small exception, and that is our transformer bank, as you can see there. We click Include Containers, though, and run it again. Uh, you can see that our container feature gets included as well. So it's not necessarily part of the actual connectivity, but it still can be part of the trace. We'll go ahead and move on and show you one more trace here, and that's uh, uh, some traces showing phase. So we have uh, the ability to use phases as what we call network attributes and include them uh, in information about the trace. So you can see here that the A phase trace will not show these B phase uh, features down below off the tap. And similarly, our B phase trace, as we run it, uh, will exclude the A phase, and so it'll, it'll effectively respect that network attribute for you. And, and so ultimately what we've just done in a very quick amount of time is build out a circuit entirely from scratch, and uh, we are showing you kind of how to use that trace, uh, excuse me, that phase to trace through and respect those attributes uh, very easily out of the box with Azure Utility Network. And I'll hand it now back to Sky for more information. Great. Thanks, Corey. All right, before we continue on, we want to do our third and final polling question, so I'll go ahead and launch this. You've heard a lot about the utility network jumpstart from Duane and the benefits that it provided uh, to the utility, but it's also extremely important to Esri to be able to uh, have your participation in these type of jumpstarts to gather more information and feedback into uh, their, their updates of the network and the re-releases. So the question is, would you consider doing a utility network jumpstart? Yes in one to three months, yes in four to six, yes in seven to nine months, or no, not interested. So we'll give it a few more minutes. We've only got about 45% in. Again, the real purpose of this is not just to get you guys familiar, though we want to do that too. It's really to ensure that Esri has all of the information available from different size utilities, and as uh, Dwayne mentioned, from different types, from cooperatives versus IOUs versus uh, municipal utilities, because there's different perspectives on all of them. All right, we've got a fair bit of the, uh, the polling back in now, and the answer is uh, just about 19% yes in the next three months, about 17% in the next four to six months, and 40% in the next seven to nine months. So that's really showing a lot of great interest uh, within the Utility Network Jumpstart. We really appreciate that, and that's, uh, again, a big piece of Esri's goal here. So kind of to tell you some other folks that have already registered and will be performing even in the pre beta release of, of Utility Network, folks that have committed. Uh, you heard from, from Dwayne and Intermountain, they were the first and the first users to get their hands on it through this uh, program. Uh, Lincoln Electric System uh, in Nebraska will be, uh, has already performed theirs. Uh, CoServe down outside of Dallas, Texas will be, uh, I think they performed theirs last week in fact. And Semper Energy will be having theirs coming up. So join this group and help bring a lot of the information we need to ensure that this network uh, is, meets your needs. I say to a lot, of, uh, a lot of utilities when I talk to them, I said, if this comes out and, and, and you begin using it in another couple years uh, and you state, man, this really doesn't work for me, I'm going to say, you know, look in the mirror because you, you had an opportunity to get involved and that's why we're encouraging everybody so heavily to participate. One other area that we can really uh, utilize your help in around utility network is uh, SSP is having their inaugural conference here May 8th to 10th, so it's coming up in just a couple of weeks, and it's called Illuminate. Now, this conference is heavily focused on the utility network. Uh, we're going to have the Esri team there, the product team specifically, in force, uh, meeting with individual utilities and helping to present on the topics around it. So if you want to learn more about what you've heard here today and get way more in-depth over a period of a couple of days, uh, this conference is definitely what you're looking for. So if you're interested, please contact Jessica. You see her email down there in the bottom right. And finally with that, I want to thank all of our presenters today for coming together and, and putting this content together. Uh, we've purposefully left a, a few minutes here at the end for, for questions. We've had quite a lot of questions coming in over the course uh, of the presentation here. I'm going to turn it back over to Joe to uh, moderate these questions. Joe? 
Great. Hey, excellent, excellent job, guys. Um, we do have some questions that have come in. And I'm going to go ahead and, and ask, ask these questions, and whoever would like to answer, go ahead and, and chime in. So the first question is, um, can you easily convert geodatabase data over to enterprise database? I'll go ahead and take that one. And I assume we're meaning can we convert today's geometric network databases uh, into the utility network, uh, into an enterprise database. Or if you really mean from the file geodatabase perspective to an enterprise geodatabase, yes, that's very easy to do at that level. Uh, but around the migration, Dwayne uh, mentioned it, and, and part of what we're doing actually now is, is migrating some uh, various geometric network circuits and systems into the utility network. And that's so important to do. Obviously, sample data works great, but there's so much value uh, to Esri and, and the partner network as we continue to migrate your data because you know, every utility we work with has a unique data case that may or may not have been handled explicitly or really seen. So we've been doing that and then feeding that information back to Esri. So the, the short answer is yes, uh, there are automated migration procedures uh, to be able to migrate this data from where you are today into the utility network. Uh, and, and the long answer is yes, we want your involvement there because the more data we can migrate over today, the better chance we're going to have at getting it right in the future. Great. Thanks, Guy. Uh, next question is, how would the utility network de-alienate security between transmission and distribution data sets? So delineate there, yeah. Delineate. Uh, I just uh, how would delineate. we delineate security? Yep. No, you're, you're spot on. Uh, it's a great question. services model that we're putting in place uh, is that we have we can publish individual sets of services for different domain networks and we can actually set security through the services end of portal and ArcGIS server tied into those domain networks so we could have transmission and electric published as different domain networks and in fact we'd encourage you that direction if, if a security uh, component is, is required uh, and then we can configure those independently with your unique user bases. Portal is really easy to tie into Active Directory, by the way, if you haven't looked that direction. So you can use your, your existing IT infrastructure even to drive your security of your future GIS, uh, much like those of you who might use SQL Server today. Great. Okay. Can a, can a recloser be at the top of a tier? Sure. Yeah, a lot of you guys use reclosers as your... Uh, effectively as your, your circuit source uh, as opposed to a circuit breaker or something like that. So, yeah, you can really define uh, the, the entire network is very configurable, meaning you can configure different uh, asset group, asset types. You heard Dwayne talk about those within the feature classes. You can use what they call network categories, which is a generic way to uh, promote one of these combinations, let's say recloser, and even a specific subtype of recloser as you, you think about it today, to be a, a source. And they call those network categories. So a combination of that and then the network attributes, which is a way of assigning individual fields to be used by the network, things like phase or open close status, those are defined as network attributes. So all of those things are configured in, and then it allows you to really show flexibility within your data model, but you're only using those fixed feature classes. Great. So we have fixed features. Can we define their attributes, or are they also fixed? Ah, uh, therein lies the tougher question. So we have fixed feature classes and you're merging all of your devices together into one device feature class. And, and, and the question that's really being asked is we have different attributes on a switch versus a breaker versus a transformer. How are we going to manage that in the future if we only have one feature class? Uh, and the answer is there's multiple ways to do it. Uh, you can either share attributes commonly across uh, the various different types. So a switch and a transformer both have phase as an example. Uh, but there might be things like a uh, different numbering or, or other different attributes you tie in individually. And what we would do is actually uh, you add those individual attributes to the, uh, to the feature class, but they'd be tied in via the layer, the feature layer, uh, still have that concept inside of Pro and or the service, uh, would be tied individually to uh, the, the different types, the switch versus the transformer. So uh, in short, yes, you can. It's going to be a little bit of a, a different piece, and that's a key part of the migration uh, to automate that and bring all those attributes together into a shared feature class. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, this question, I believe, is before Dwayne. And uh, Dwayne, when does IREA plan to implement the utility network? Uh, <clears throat> good question. Uh, I showed you that slide with all the initiatives that are going on this year. Um, so we, we did the jump start prior to all of that getting started because there was time. Uh, it does look like uh, the rest of our year will be booked up with a lot of those other initiatives. 
Uh, the other thing we've done is we've gotten in touch with Esri and started the Enterprise uh, Advantage program, and they're going to help us map all this out. Um, but I mentioned we had to do portal. Um, portal is probably something that we'll budget for uh, first quarter of next year and get that rolled out, and we'll start looking at data migration sometime in next year. Great. All right. Uh, are ArcGIS Pro projects per user or shared to all users in a geo database? Uh, I know where some of these questions are going. Uh, so the project, and for everybody's uh, uh, mindset, that, that's the comparable when we say uh, ArcGIS Pro project is the MXD, the map document from uh, the ArcMap world. So the question, are they shared or are they to individual? Uh, and the answer is we're deploying typically with a, a standardized uh, project that will be used by all users. So that's preset. Uh, however, of course, like a, a map document, they are currently individualized. I mean, you can set it up, uh, the templates, uh, the, the way you want to some extent. You can set up the look and feel uh, to some extent. But you'd always start with a core uh, view of, of that project. And again, that project includes all the references to, of course, the, the services that we've pulled in from Portal, uh, the toolboxes, you saw us using various GP tasks, geoprocessing tasks, uh, again, as well as some of the, uh, the layout of our toolbars, et cetera. Uh, so it's not stored in the geo database. It is file-based, uh, but we do envision having a, a published version of that that is used by all users to maintain a consistent interaction with the utility now. Yep, and I'll also add just a small portion there. If you're not familiar with ArcGIS Pro, there's also uh, significantly easier ways to, uh, to share out your projects, to package them out and to, uh, to push them out to other users as well. So uh, just, just a small additional point there that, that you can share these projects out pretty easily as well. All right. Um, Larry Young, if I may add one quick comment to that too. Am I okay, Joe? Yeah, go ahead, Larry. Okay, so with, with Pro, you, you have the ability to share those projects via your portal, and we are working very closely with the map team to uh, do things like automatically update you when the project has changed within your portal and so on. So the real base sharing of these projects with all the components that Sky mentioned will be through your portal. Even better. That's good news. We didn't know about that one. All right. Thanks for chiming in, Larry. Um, we've probably got a, a couple more questions. Uh, we're running out of time. Um, just let you guys know, there was a lot of questions, and we're not going to be able to get to them all, but we will we will answer those questions if you if you did have one. But um, let me go ahead and move on. Uh, why would we want a transformer to be a contain? Why would we want a transformer to be a container? Why do you need the extra detail inside it? Well, the extra detail, if you think about the real world. And again, we're trying to model these networks. The utility network is really uh, visualizing the real world in a digital nature. We've heard, uh, as we talk about, the digital twin. I don't know if you've heard that, that, uh, that piece yet, but it's an interesting one to really model real world assets in, in a real way in the, in the, inside the software. Uh, and by doing that, we're promoting those individual assets. And in the field, if you have three cans, three transformers on a pole, Today, we put them in as one point, and it doesn't quite model at the granular level that we need to. So we're promoting those to individual points uh, with individual terminals allows us to get a lot more granular. And you've got to remember, we're not just thinking about how can we make our geometric network work inside of, of Pro and inside of Utility Network. We're really thinking about where the industry, the overall uh, utility industry, is heading tomorrow and in 5, 10, 15 years. And that evolution of, of ADMS, uh, distribution management system, it utilizes, this is really heading into that smart grid concept as you go there, and it utilizes a much a higher granularity of the data. So that's why we want to shift that, that direction. The idea of a container being the transfer bank is really there for cartographic purposes so that at certain zoom or scale levels we can see a single point. But to allow us to pass that data, and again GIS is the foundational data source for ADMS and other uh, systems that we're going to see emerge. And again, we don't know all those requirements, but we're trying to, as we've created a system that we can now utilize to support growth within the industry for, for all of that period of time. Great, Sky. You know, I think, uh, you know, we're about out of time here. I think we're going to go ahead and, and conclude the webinar now. Again, um, we will, if you, ha if you ask a question, we will get it, we will get the answer to you. Um, so so that, that, the, that concludes our webinar. Um, hope you guys got a lot out of it. And uh, thank you guys for attending. And please answer the survey questions before you log off. Have a wonderful day.